Good morning, everybody. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. It's truly a blessing and an honor. Before we even start introductions, I do want to address what today represents. Today is September 10th, 2023, meaning that it has been nearly 22 years since tragedy struck our country. It's going to be a little different 9-11 speech than what you're used to, because I wasn't alive when 9-11 happened. It's 2001. I was born 2004. Let that sink in. Every year we hear Pastor Manny's firsthand experience of 9-11 from a perspective of a man living in New York during these times. I have a much different point of view. Um, I may not have underlying trauma from what happened on, those, on that day and the weeks following, but what I do have is a legacy. When I was a kid in elementary school, I remember they would show us videos and stories and testimonies of the things that went on. And those of us who are younger, you probably remember this. And if you don't, I don't know if they still do it in school, but those younger still in school, you might get to see some videos soon and you'll know what I'm talking about. But I remember seeing videos and stories of things that took place on that day. And it didn't scare me as a kid. It inspired me. I saw what it meant to be an American, truly what it meant, even when we were struck with tragedy. There were men and there were women rushing to rescue victims and their families. See, the word compassion means to suffer with one another. And as a young child, I was well pleased with my American heritage because of this. Because even though I had no idea what America truly went through as a whole on September 11th, 2001, but I did know that America went through it as a whole. So I can't give you a firsthand testimony, but I can share the importance of spreading love in the midst of tragedy in order to pass on the bloody but beautiful comeback story that is 9-11. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we invite you here. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come move in our lives as I speak, Lord, as we listen. Give us ears that hear, give us spirits that receive, and give me a tongue that speaks your word, Jesus. We're here for you, and let us, let us align with that and with that only. It's in your Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, my name is Brendan Shannon. I'm a servant of Christ, in turn, making me a servant to all. Uh, I'm currently uh, studying at Kilgore College. I've got a major in history, and when I go to UT Tyler, I'll be minoring in English with hopes to be a history professor and an author. Uh, some of you know me as a young man and as a youth who started preaching when I was real young at our Longview campus many years ago, and others know me as just not as young of a man who gets up here and teaches the historical lessons and talks about all the background information. Uh, but today, I want to start a brand new precedent. Today is going to be a little different than what I usually do. Uh, rather than reading a whole chapter and going on the geography and the historical value of everything, I'm actually just going to focus on six main scripture today. So today we're going to be reading from the gospel according to Mark. So for those of you who have Bibles or Bible apps, I encourage you to read along with me. Uh, so that's going to be Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, so we're going to be f focusing on two major sets of scripture here. Uh, we're going to see one that's focused on the actions of Jesus, or actually the lack thereof, and then the actions of the disciples. So once again, Mark chapter 6, verse 1. But while we're reading our scripture, I want to remember something. We're currently in a sermon series, and that sermon series is titled Side Effects. So this is a meaty piece of scripture. It really is. When you look at it, there's a lot. There's a very big quote in this, but we're going to be looking at it from the point of view of showing us what the side effects of following Jesus are. So while we're reading our scripture, let's keep that in mind. Let it digest in that way. So let's go ahead and get in our word. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up. So this is Mark 6, verses 1 through 6, reading, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. All right, before we really dive into this any further, I do want to give some background information on what this is. So this is Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 5, three really, really big things happen. Um, so right before that, Jesus cast out legion. For those who don't know, legion refers to an army of at least 1,000 people, meaning this dude had at least 1,000 demons, and he cast them all out. Pretty big thing. He, he heals the bleeding woman. A lot of us have heard that story. If you haven't, come to me afterwards. I'll explain it to you. I'd be happy to. But he heals the bleeding woman among the crowd. And then afterwards, Jesus raises a 12-year-old girl from the dead. Three pretty big things that happened right before this. So the reason people of Nazareth 
had no faith was not due to a lack of works because the works were there and they were heavy. It was not due to a lack of vindication because the vindication was there and it was heavy. The three things done just before this are some of the most talked about scripture like to this day. And they were talked about then too. Uh, when we look at the story of the bleeding woman, we see that the crowd is so big that one of the disciples says to Jesus, this is Mark 5:31. it says, you see the crowd pressing around you. The crowd was so heavy and so thick, they were swimming through people. And when someone touched Jesus, they were like, oh, yeah, people touch you. They're touching you all the time right now. He was attracting crowds that filled up entire cities. This was not due to a lack of works. He wasn't just showing up saying, oh, just believe me. No, he was doing stuff. It was not due to a lack of works. It was because Jesus, I mean, there were signs, wonders, and miracles following this, but Nazareth still didn't believe. When we talk about side effects of following Jesus, we have two types. There's negative and positive. Negative side effects and positive side effects. Think about prescription medicine. And listen, so I went back last week. I wasn't here. I didn't get to make it. And I watched Manny's sermon, and I know he brought up prescription medicine, but I'm going to do it again because that's what everybody thinks when we think side effects is prescription medicine. So I'm going to bring it back up. Uh, so think about a medicine commercial. You know the type. And when it comes on, it says what's the purpose of the medicine, and then the possible side effects, which are always terrible, come up. It's always the, the beautiful family wearing linen clothes with their kids and their dog. This family does not exist, but it's like the perfect nuclear family. And then they tell you what the drug is for, the purpose, like real quick and brief. And then they read off an extensive list. You know the type. Internal bleeding, loss of appetites, hallucinations, memory loss, death. You know the type. It's the, it's the stuff that makes you not want to take it at all. But the reason people still take it and we can't forget is that the medicine brings improvement to a necessary bodily need, even in that. So do you know the two main causes for negative side effects in medicine? Listen, this is according to Google. You can check my sources. If you look up <laughs> what causes negative side effects, exactly what I'm about to read to you is what's going to come up. First thing on Google. So chemistry majors, please correct me. But Google says it's dosage and interaction between taking other medicines. Dosage and the interaction between other medicines. With that being said, I just want to read something real quick before I really dive into this, before we're like, wait, what's the point of you sharing this with me? What do you mean other medicine? So I just want to read Galatians 5, 6 through 24, skim through it at least. And it says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And then it reads off all the works of the flesh, all the bad things that people do. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, those type, drunkenness, envy. And then immediately after, in verse 22, it tells us the fruit of the Spirit, which is the good things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, but the important part of after reading that tells us the acts of the flesh, the fruits of the Spirit. And then 24 says... And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with it, its passions and desires, meaning they've killed it, and the passions and desires got to go too. On that, I want to piggyback with Ephesians 6 and read one verse, chapter tw or verse 12, which reads, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Galatians tells us about the acts of the flesh. Everybody say acts of the flesh. One more time. There we go. I'm going to do this a couple more times, by the way. I like it. <laughs> so, acts of the flesh. But when we read Ephesians, what does it say? We don't fight against what? Flesh and blood. We don't fight against flesh and blood. But it just said these are the acts of the flesh. But instead it says we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against the spiritual forces of evil. So it's really the, the acts of the spiritual forces of evil working in us. There's dosage. The dosage of the Holy Spirit and the dosage of the spiritual forces of evil. So now this could mean two things. First, and this isn't what's necessarily happening in Scripture, but since it's a side effect, I'm going to address it. If we have accepted Jesus in our hearts and we're baptized in his name by water and by spirit, we have now taken a dosage of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. But if we don't accept Jesus, and when I say don't accept Jesus, listen, I'm not saying I prayed one prayer every single time that we decide not to follow Jesus, we are not accepting him there. We're not accepting him there. We're rejecting him there. So every time we don't accept him, even in one spot or as a whole, and instead we walk in that sin or in all sin, 
fulfilling the acts of the flesh, we now have a dosage of the spiritual forces of evil. Everybody say evil. 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 Could you now see a problem arise when you ask them to share a home in your heart? Don't really work. It's not very nice. Paul said, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. King James Version says, contrary to one another. They are not the same, and they are opposite. It's going to be a problem when you ask them to the same, share the same home in your heart. This is how we get something called internal conflict. Everybody say, internal conflict. Internal, internal conflict. I could do a whole sermon series on just that. But that's not what we see here, because we're reading about Jesus here. And Jesus doesn't have internal conflict because he's perfect. So we don't see that. Instead, we do see some external conflict. So in the same way the Holy Spirit and the spiritual forces of evil don't cooperate within ourselves, they don't really cooperate outside together either. Uh, so those who are being led by the Holy Spirit are going to experience something called conflict or persecution because they don't, they don't cooperate with one another. They don't get along. Everybody say persecution. 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 That's something you'll experience. When those are being led by the Holy Spirit, you're going to feel a natural persecution from people who are servants of this world and servants of their flesh. But what acts of the flesh are we seeing here in this verses 1 through 6? We see enmity, which is the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. We see this, we see enmity, when they scoff at Jesus for being a carpenter and they insult his family. The state of feeling or being actively opposed, making fun of him, scoffs at him, insults his family. We see strife. Anger or, bitterness or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues. Well, what's the fundamental issue? Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. That's the fundamental issue that they're not agreeing on. And dissensions. Disagreement that leads to discord. It says they took offense to him. And when Jesus says, let me get back to it. When Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. He's actually, a, he's addressing them because they were so offended at him, they had to take it to him. And there was discord there. Jesus was addressing them. So that's just three right there. Here is what happens when the acts of the flesh meet that which is perfect. That means when that which is perfect lives in us, those who are servants of this world will naturally oppose us. That's just one of the side effects. But what is Jesus' response to this unbelief? Verse 5 says, And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now before I start breaking down the scripture, I said there were two types of side effects. Everybody say two. Two. One more time. Two. Negative and negative. Positive, negative and positive. What are some of the positive side effects of following Jesus? So we see here that Jesus doesn't even consider healing the sick to be mighty work. But why is that important to this scripture? Why does it say that? Why does it feel the need to say that and address that? And you may be thinking like, well, I don't know, but how does that even relate to us? But let me read. So John 14, 12, it, it says that those who follow me will do the things that I have done and far greater. That's Jesus' words. In Mark 16, in the Great Commission, he says, and these signs will accompany those who follow me. And then he lists a bunch of things that are eyebrow-raising in church that are only possible by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because a perfect example of this is actually immediately after what we just read. I'm not just going to jump around Scripture and try. It's literally immediately after this. So I'm going to go ahead and read verses 7 through 13 real quick, which read, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. His response to this was to equip his disciples and his followers to go do it too. He was like, okay, you don't believe me? That's fine. Y'all go do it. And at first he says, hey, just stay with Israel and y'all go and do this. But that's his goal. His, his response to people's unbelief of Jesus is to equip us to go do things. Equip us to go out there and preach repentance and these signs follow. That's what he does here positive side effect. I think that sounds pretty cool. Um, after this, Jesus and his disciple, they leave after this. So basically they go out, they preach repentance, all these signs follow. Everyone's like, okay, this is for real. And then they come back and then they leave. Jesus is like, all right, cool. Well, I'm done here. I've, I've met my family. I've talked to him. I'm done. And they leave. Immediately after they leave, the first place they touch down, Jesus feeds the 5,000. After this is when he walks on water. And then after that is when he healed the whole region. It says the whole region brought their sick. Matthew 10, it's, it's the synonic repeat. 
says that not a single person left unhealed. Every single person they brought was healed. Every single one. So before Jesus returned home, what happened? He was performing great miracles while he was being surrounded by the faithful. After Jesus left Nazareth, he was performing great miracles while surrounded by the faithful. I mean, notice I didn't even have to read you the stories. We were just like, oh, yeah, no, I know those. These are great things that he was doing before and after while surrounded by the faithful. However, while he was in Nazareth, according to King James Version, it says he could do no great miracle. This is external conflict. Everybody say external conflict. External. external conflict. How does this apply to today's believers? To today, to you, to me. If Jesus could do no great miracles with the doubtful, there's no way he's going to do them through the doubtful. If he could do no great miracle with the doubtful, he's not going to be able to do it through the doubtful. If we lack faith, how can we expect to see positive side effects in following Christ? If we lack faith, how can we see movement in Christ? I was reading yesterday, actually, but it was 1 John in chapter 5. He says that the way that we have overcome the world and taken victory is through our faith. That is what he says. He's like, that's the key. That is the key to success over the world. It's faith. If we lack that, we're not going to be able to walk with him correctly the way he wants. 1 Corinthians 12 describes faith as a spiritual gift. Faith is compared to speaking in tongues, healing the sick, and performing miracles. Those are three things that when you read them in church, they're eyebrow raising and people are like, mm, I don't know about those. But faith is compared next to them. We don't really question that one. Why? Why is faith compared to these things that some people, that makes them feel uncomfy? Why is it compared to these things? Because faith is a gift. And the, the gift of faith is when our faith is so great that it begins to pour out onto other people. And that faith that we have begins to reciprocate in them, causing a chain reaction in everybody. It's a gift from God, used to magnify his kingdom. We look at faith and we're like, oh, faith is just for my own progress. God uses our faith to get other people to have it too. That is kind of the point. But when we doubt God and his abilities, we will be treated as Nazareth. We will be treated as Nazareth. If we are wanting to see the positive side effects in following Christ, then for us to see them, we need to be willing to walk into a new level of maturity with Jesus. Because a lot of times we like the good benefits because, listen, even just stepping into, I don't know, just a relationship with Jesus right at the beginning, that's really good. And a lot of the benefits are good. And then it kind of gets a little uncomfy and scary the more we walk into it. But if we're going to see these positive side effects, what we need to do is be willing to walk into maturity with Jesus. In order to see the action of the Holy Spirit, we need to ensure that we are walking as Jesus did. The writer of Hebrews, possibly being Paul, tells us what a mature relationship in Christ reflects. He tells us, kind of a little fundamental, as well as the difference between a baby believer and a mature believer. So I just want to read this real quick for you. It's been on my heart. It's chapter 5, verse 12, through chapter 6, verse 2. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Paul, or the unknown writer, tells us the difference between a baby believer and the mature believer. He claims repentance from sin, which is the change of mind and the actual work towards it, is milk. It's baby believers. Faith towards God. I'm going to just say this one is believing that God exists because it's kind of hard to walk into maturity if you still don't really know if he exists yet. Baptisms, the washing, baptism, Holy Spirit, baptism, the instruction is what it says, the instruction of baptisms, the laying on of hands. And now this is used for many, many things throughout the Bible but the laying on of hands and praying for people for whatever that may mean. The resurrection of the dead. Okay, I've been waiting to address this one because I know I read that and everyone was like, you're telling me to be a fundamental basic Christian, I gotta pull people out of their caskets? The answer is no, that is not what that's meant. And that's why it's compared to eternal judgment. The resur it's talking about the resurrection of souls, preaching the difference between heaven and hell, knowing the difference between heaven and hell, where God lies and where the enemy lies. That's why it's compared to eternal judgment. Those things are grouped together for a reason. Because the first time I read that, I was like, no way. There is no way that is fundamental. 
but possibly Paul, once again. Tradition says it's Paul, but we don't really know. But the writer of Hebrews claims that the bare minimum of baby believers is this doctrine. He claims that repentance of sin is milk, that the faith towards God is milk, that the instruction of baptisms is milk, that the laying on of hands is milk, that the resurrection of dead and eternal judgment, so knowing heaven from hell, is milk. He says that's the foundation. Let us not lay again another foundation. That's the foundation of our faith. That's what the writer of Hebrews claims to be the side effects of Christianity and baby Christianity at that. That's what he says. No matter how bad we desire to be used by God, no matter how badly we want to see miracles happen, no matter how bad we want to see people give their life to Jesus, if we limit what the Holy Spirit is capable of doing, we're not going to see any of it. We get God on God's terms or we don't. If he wants to go do this, you better go do it. We won't see any of these things happen if we are filled with doubt because we will be treated as Nazareth. We must have faith in Christ Jesus and all that he can do. And he can do everything. Do you know what the opposite of faith is? It's not doubt. Ironically, I've been talking about doubt a lot. It's not doubt. It's certainty. The opposite of faith is certainty. Everybody say certainty. 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 If we have to be certain about what God's plan is for us, we don't have faith. That's not how faith works. What did Jesus tell the disciples in Mark 6? He told them not to take anything. He said, don't take anything. No food, no bag, no money, not even a change of clothes. It's like, you'll be fine. No change of clothes. There was no certainty there except for the fact that they were following exactly what God said, when he said it, and how he said it. That was the only certainty. That's called faith. And what does John say? We win the world with our faith. That is how we please God, with our faith. And when they did this, they saw signs, they saw wonders, they saw miracles, they saw people leading to Jesus, they saw that, and they were doing it. Jesus was using them because of their faith, and which is why he wasn't being able to use Nazareth, because they had none. We need trust. We don't need doubt. We need faith. We do not need certainty, because that's not something, thou shalt have certainty, I haven't heard that one. But faith is pretty dang important, and it's described as a gift from God. So how do we get it? How do you get any other gift? If you sit here today and you feel like you're lacking faith, and some of us are. I've lacked faith in many situations, and sometimes it comes and it goes. But the application to feeling like, oh, I don't know where to get more faith, because like, that's easier said than done, and it is. It is easier said than done. The application is very easy, though. You spend time alone with God, and you ask him for it. That's it. And that's most things. God, I can't, I can't get rid of this. Remember, the repentance is the change of mind. And a lot of time, and I know I'm kind of going off the wing with this one, but repentance is the change of mind. So when you're sitting here, you're like, oh, I'm just struggling with this, and I can't get out of it. The repentance is there. Now we have to sit alone with God and do what? God, I, I, I need you to help me with this. God, I need you to take this with me. I, I'm, I'm repenting. My mind has changed, but I, I need you to help me. It's the same with faith. It's like, God, I'm not seeing things move in my life because I feel like I don't have much faith. Give me some of that. We need to ask him for faith that moves mountains. And remember, he said it's the size of a mustard seed. It's not that much. He didn't say you need a bunch of faith to see stuff happen. He's like, you just got to have a little bit. Faith that pours onto other people where we see chain reactions where it reciprocates in other people, the faith that we have. This is what we need to ask for in our alone time with God. Faith is the currency of heaven. All things that God does are done through faith. And God is the distributor of that currency. Everything that God gives to us is so we can give it back. So we can give it back. In the book of Matthew, uh, they use this against him in his, in his trial, but when they go up to Jesus, they're like, oh, well, what do you say about us paying taxes? He's like, well, who created your coin? They're like, Caesar. He's like, well, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give back to God what is God's. He's not given us faith to just sit on it. That's the point. We need to give back to God what is God's. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And I pray that what needs to sit would sit in the individual, Lord. 
I thank you for all the opportunity you give us and all the blessings that you have distributed to us, Lord. And I pray that as we go out in this week that you would give us faith, and not just faith, but call to action to use it, Jesus. Because you are not a God of stillness. You are a God of movement. So help us be that movement, Jesus. Help us truly be a church that moves, that acts, and that is walking with you as you did. Jesus, I thank you for everything you do. And I pray that your grace would shed on every single one of these people in here today, including myself. It's in your holy, pray, it's in your holy name and character we pray. Amen.